Welcome to On The Level, broadcasting from the Blue Ocean Network studios here in Beijing. My name is Fergus Thompson. Now, there are few people who can be unaware of the policy uh, known by the Chinese government officially as the family planning policy, but almost universally known as the one-child policy. It's uh, come up in the news regularly over the past 30 years or so, sometimes for, for harrowing images of uh, excesses in implementation, sometimes for unintended consequences, such as uh, a skewed gender ratio or uh, an aging population affecting the economy. But Recently it's been in the news for quite a different reason and that is because the Chinese government has announced a relaxation in the policy. Now this would in effect allow certain couples to, who are currently barred from having two children to do so without any penalty. So uh, is this a two-child policy? Well, not quite, because one of those uh, parents must themselves be an only child. Now, uh, to discuss these changes, uh, the policy itself, and uh, why some people feel that scrapping rather than revision might be the path to follow, I'm pleased to say we're joined in the studio by uh, James Liang. James is a professor of uh, economics at uh, Beida University here in Beijing. He's also the CEO and uh, co-founder of uh, C-Trip, that's uh, China's uh, leading online travel agency, uh, sort of a Chinese uh, Expedia, I suppose. Now, uh, James is also uh, quite a vocal mm, uh, opponent of the continuation of the policy and is speaking today in a personal capacity um, for uh, your reasons as to why this is not only against individual rights, but also uh, a threat to China's future. Um, James, welcome to On The Level. And uh, I would like to say first, you are a, obviously a very successful entrepreneur, a very busy person. What led you to take such an interest in this topic and, and mm. to spend so much time in it? Because you write about it regularly, mm. you comment on it regularly, you've written a book on mm. it. Well, I basically actually pursued a second academic career about eight years ago when I was doing a PhD in economics at Stanford. And my area of study is actually entrepreneurship. And I found out that actually demographic structure or age structure of a country has a very big effect on the uh, entrepreneurship for that given country. And at that time, I came across the, the future forecast of China's demographic structure and as an impact, as a result of this one-child policy. And I found very pessimistic uh, forecast for, for, for the demographic structure and economic outlook. And the very skewed or very old age structure will have a very negative effect on China's economic future. That's why I got very much concerned and mm -hmm. want to see uh, how this uh, uh, analysis on my research get known to the government and the public and hopefully that will speed up the reform. Uh, there's actually a lot of study uh, actually already been done on the economic impact of mm -hmm. uh, aging population. But my specific angle is actually, this is actually a frontier research is looking at the effect on entrepreneurship, which has been increasingly become a much more, a more and more important factor in economic success. Right, well we'll come back to that uh, because you did write a paper on entrepreneurship mm -hmm. and, and, and its effect. We'll come back to it later, but I think it might be useful at this stage just to give an idea to people of what the one-child policies mm -hmm. it's often referred to is or isn't. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't affect the entire population, but 60-65% uh, ethnic minorities, uh, a small number, uh, people in the countryside who have a girl are allowed to have another go, and uh, more recently couples where both children were only children mm -hmm. themselves were allowed uh, with certain restrictions mm -hmm. to have another child. Now we're moving to this uh, situation where only one of those parents has to be an only child. Do you think these relaxations, is this the beginning of the end for the policy? Well, certainly, yeah, but the pace uh, is uh, not fast enough. Uh, or China, I think, uh, probably taking its course and given the current pace of uh, you know, reform, probably will do away with one-child policy in maybe five or ten years. Uh, That's uh, what the government uh, you know, uh, implies. But uh, I think uh, in China right now, given the level of development, given how low the fertility currently is, China should really do away completely the one-child policy. Because uh, to my calculation, uh, and a lot of other demographers already predict that China will not have a, even a replacement level, or much below replacement right. level so fertility So for you, this is, this is a case of 
urgency. It's urgent that this that these reforms take place. That that it should go immediately. Yeah, it's actually pretty urgent. Mm -hmm. uh, on average, a woman only have 1.2 to 1.3 babies, and that's of course uh, as a result of this very strict one-child policy right. in the city and some sort of well, relaxed uh, way of implementing it uh, in, the, in, in a, a rural area. Rural, where where okay. so in some cases a second uh, child can be had yeah. the first and go right. So, but uh, based on experience of the other countries, if you have a no one-child policy, a complete you know, freedom to have as many as babies you mm -hmm. want, uh, China at this stage of development will probably have 1.5 babies per woman. So right. that's about 20% gap between 1.2 and 1.5 because it's one child policy. And if you do away with that and only half of the population, you probably see a rebound of 15%. Um, but that's uh, over a long run. A lo longer period. But in, in the, in the, in the, in the mm -hmm. short run, there may be some catch up effect. So right. you, you will probably do. Um, 20 to 30 percent, at most, 20 to 30 percent. That's those would be eligible. Will, re will have mm -hmm. a rebound. Um, looking at the, the, the history of the policy, it, it, from, from around 1980 mm -hmm. when it was introduced now, um, if you ha talk to a, a mm -hmm. child on the street mm -hmm. here and you ask them, what is the one-child policy done? You'll get this answer almost trotted out mm -hmm. immediately. It's averted 400 million births in China. This would have, uh, we would have had 400 million extra. Um, would, 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 would that be an accurate figure, do you feel? Ha, has it done that? Well, let's look first at, 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 at something here. This is a, a, a TFR, total fertility rate, I think we should explain. This is the uh, average number of, women, uh, of children born to a woman, as you, as you said, um, over a lifetime. And we see from 1950 to 2010 there, it, it, it certainly drops a lot from up six a bit there down to sort of w well under two. But if actually the, the one-child policy came into place in 1980, the drop there seems to be the, the, the huge majority actually happened before that. So what sort of success has the policy had? Yeah, that's certainly over-exaggeration. The one-child policy has reduced population by 400 million. Because that's under the assumption that the fertility will remain to be very high mm -hmm. uh, without the one-child uh, policy. Actually, when the urbanization comes around, when the you know, the fertility rate uh, will, will drop na naturally uh, as experienced by almost every other country. As you can see, before 1980s, uh, the fertility already started to drop rapidly to just above 12, uh, above replacement level. And the, and after the one-child policy, actually, you see the fertility has rebounded a little bit. Certainly, yeah, there's a slight... Yeah, yeah so there's the people there. rush to have the baby in anticipation. Right. And you see that uh, in the, after 90s, you really dropped uh, way below the replacement, policy, mm -hmm. uh, uh, replacement level. Actually, this figure you probably took from the official Chinese government. Actually, the, the, the data, the recent data, is actually showing that the fertility is actually much lower than the graph. Than indicated here in 2010. Yeah, it's right. In 2010, the, the, the fertility rate is just above 1, it's about 1.2, 1.3. Right, different so figures coming from, from different sources then, but yeah. um, the, this is, uh, also we should point out that 2.1 is generally considered a replacement rate for mm -hmm. a population, so if we're looking at that. Now talking about sort of the, the, the more, the man in the street here, the, the woman in the street in China, it, it's been my experience mm -hmm. talking to people about the one-child policy, and it's something that very mm -hmm. often comes up, that they will say, well it's not ideal, but mm -hmm. it's necessary, or it was necessary because uh, we have, or had too many people, and you can understand, you will hear this phrase, rentaidola, rentaidola, as somebody squashes onto a, a subway train in Shanghai or they're crushed out of a, of a department store or something. That phrase, rentaidola, uh, this, this too many people, you actually borrowed that for the title of, of, of your book, uh, which is entitled uh, Too Many People in China, using that very common phrase, but with a question mark importantly after it. And uh, you, um, presumably from the book, your answer to that question, that rhetorical question, would be no. Uh, people will tell you, look, without this policy, China could not feed itself. Uh, we have this, another very common figure, 7% of arable land, almost a fifth of the world's population. What do you say to somebody who, who, who says that to you? Surely that's the fact. Um, well, the, 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 the misconception of China has too many people has been around for many, many years. And part of the blame for China's economic problem, you know, before the reform was sound too many people. Mm -hmm. 
And that was the period when China still have very high fertility rate, you know, three, five in the, in, in the six, uh, the 60s, 50s. Yeah, three and five is really, you know, we have too many babies. But right now the fertility rate is only 1.2, 1.3. That's really too few baby. So it's not the total population, it's actually the age structure that's more important. So it's better to have a more stable or slightly expanding or slightly shrinking um, uh, the age structure, the rather stable age structure. In the future, actually, China will import more fruit, but not because China has not enough land. It's actually China will not have enough labor devoted to agriculture. And right now, the, the young people in, in the rural area, they all actually go out to work in the factories. Mm -hmm. And what's remaining on the land to, in the agriculture industry is sort of older people, and they, they, these people will go away. And in the future, just like Japan, Korea, they will actually have very few people, resources or labor resources devoted to agriculture, and uh, not because of the So this, land. you're saying this would be an argument yeah. against a, a smaller population? Yeah, that, mm. that's, I mean, actually agriculture is not that important anymore for China. Uh, we've had a, a month of appalling pollution here in Beijing and much of northern China and 15% uh, of the country today not too bad thank, thankfully but uh, this pollution caused by power stations by the extra cars by the the, the products being consumed by, by, by these all, all these people surely there's some argument there to say that uh, more people are going to cause more pollution yeah but that's a very small factor and uh, China is, uh, if uh, the fertility rate of, uh, you know, 1.2, 1.3 will probably add two or three million babies each year. That's actually do, will do very good for China's, uh, um, you know, age structure. But uh, it will add only, you know, uh, you know th one to two percent, I don't know, in five years of the China's population. That's, that, that's, that's, that's very minuscule. And but China's energy consumption has expanded, you know, ten times probably in the last. So 10 you, years. It's, it's not in ratio to the population; it's yeah. in ratio to to increase it's, expectations. It's a way of uh, China's uh, economic structure that's highly skewed to export to manufacturing, and the lack, you know, lack of uh, regulation or investment into the pollution control. It's just the, the figure that you come up there, this TFR, total fertility rate now, as you, you did mention that th those figures seem a little odd. Uh, figures from the National Health and uh, Family Planning Commission come out with a figure of 1.8, which you would dispute, mm -hmm. and, and indeed which many others would, would, would dispute, um, based on, on census figures, there, there are various figures. So you're saying it, the actual rate is, you're basing this on census figures, is that correct? Yeah, you actually did two consecutive census figures in 2000, 2000 and, and 2010. 2010. Mm. And it's, you know, it makes sense because you only allow most of the people in China to have one child and put very heavy fine mm -hmm. to have a second child. Yes. How could the Right. Uh, be even much more higher, much, how could the actual fertility well, be well, talking higher about, than Well, talking that. about fines, you wrote recently um, a, an article about uh, somebody our viewers may know, Zhang Yimou, probably China's mm -hmm. most famous film director, who, who paid a $1.2 million approximately fine uh, after he was found uh, to, according to the authorities, have had three children in contravention of the policy. What had you to say about that particular case? Because it was a high-profile case which brought this policy into the news. Well, that's just show the absurdity of this policy. Well, the Zhang Yimou, a very successful you know, uh, artist, uh, and uh, presumably he certainly has the capacity to raise very high-quality kids. Mm -hmm. And these extra kids that he has raised will do such a big harm to the Chinese society so that he has to be fined over a million dollars for that. <laughs> That's just so, so absurd. Right. That shows how wrong the policy is. So, so this, um, uh, this fine, we should point out, it's actually not called a fine. It's called a sort of a social maintenance fee. The idea mm. is that it replaces the cost, that, that, mm. that burden that that child will, in theory, mm. put, put on society. That's one end of the ladder. What about the other end, the normal cases? China is without doubt a society that loves children. You've only got to go to a restaurant, you see the grandparents doting, you walk along the street and people will come over your child and ask all about it. Yet in this same society, in July 2012, we had the case of uh, Feng Jianmei, a young woman who in Shanxi was in violation, apparently, of the policy, was taken from her home, hooded, 
um, uh, forcibly injected with an abortifacient and, and, and had a stillbirth the next day. This caused outrage mm. uh, I I in the rest of the world, indeed also, also here in China. Um, do you feel that the, the outrage over this case was would have, on the emotional side, pushed people who would have supported the policy beforehand a bit against it? Uh, apart from economic factors, just the emotion. Thing. Yeah, from a human rights issue, actually, uh, people are all against it. Uh, and uh, of course, the government has relaxed the forced implementation of uh, this, this kind. And the most they can't really rely on, you know, putting up economic uh, you know, fines uh, to, to uh, but a very heavy fine on, right. on but, the people. But, uh, not an isolated so, case. It it, it 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 was well publicized. But mm. uh, it, we must point out, forced abortion is against the law. This is illegal in China, and, and people operated illegally mm. in this case. But uh, the local officials, somebody was mm. fired. That mm. was about it. Mm. Um, some people do manage to to uh, give birth mm. uh, outside the policy, but their children then are in a strange position whereby. They virtually don't exist. Mm. They, 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 they can't get a, a family registration. Mm. They can't get an ID card. They can't get a passport. Mm. They, 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 they find it difficult to get education. You've also written about this section of, of, of society, these children who, who are born but are mm. non-people. Do you feel that they represent any, any danger to society? Or? Oh, yes. Yeah, so certainly, that's a big problem. You know, these people will not be educated properly. These people will not feel that's a part of you know, uh, civil a society and these, these people will not to be you know have the same kind of a job prospect as other people and these people will feel you know very uh, resentful I guess mm -hmm. for alienated the government. From, yes right but it's and not a huge policy. number is it uh, it's not a small number because <laughs> if everybody uh, have baby according to the rules China will have a fertility rate of, of one right, right. right. the fact that we have 1.3 1.2 and if Remember, I had a lot of people, you know, remain single and don't have a baby. Mm -hmm. So, as there's a lot of out of it, policy, it, birth, a difficult number to assess yeah. simply because they it's don't. It's not exist. small. It's actually mm -hmm. quite. Small. Um, you you wrote a, a paper, 2012. It was called "Will the One Child Policy Reduce Entrepreneurship in China?" And you looked at the cases of of Japan and the total fertility rate there, and uh, about 1.4 or something, and South Korea, uh, even lower than mm -hmm. that. What sort of conclusions? Tell me about this entrepreneurship, because this is a particular uh, pet of yours. Yeah, that's a frontier research. Actually, it got a lot of attention from the academic world. Uh, I looked at many countries. I actually looked at all the countries, their entrepreneurship activity, and by looking at you know, by survey data, their venture, venture capital data, and their uh, new business started data, and lo also comp and then look at their age structure. Uh, by the, the past. The, there's a very strong positive correlation between how young your country is and uh, how vital, how active or how strong your uh, entrepreneurship activities right. are. And it's not in the developing country but also in developed countries. And the magnitude is quite striking. So 1% more young population will actually have uh, 5% will, will increase entrepreneurship by 5%. So you have a five-fold increase. And you actually can explain, for, for example, Japan, you actually explain half of its uh, economic problem or half of its uh, for low uh, entrepreneurship uh, rate. And you can explain half of the, that problem by, by its age structure. And uh, we so all know Japan. lost that vitality for innovation yeah. and entrepreneurship that you'd had in the yeah. 1970s and yeah. 80s. Well, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So the the fewer babies Japanese had in the 70s, 80s actually is a, a direct contribution to the economic problem in the 90s. And then people in the past economists think that uh, the, the Japan problem, the Japan's economic right. problem in the 90s was due to like financial crisis and other factors. But my research has shown that the lack of, of you know, Good new companies like lack of a Silicon Valley. Right, right. It's kind of in Japan is actually a major economic problem and the low entrepreneurship rate. And the reason that aging countries don't have as much entrepreneurship on innovation is because the young people, when in the, for example, in the company, when most uh, your employees are the 50 year old rather than 30 year old, and all the major decisions, all the resources, all the connections are taken or occupied by the older people. And the older people tend to uh, not as creative, not as 
um, open for new kind of technology or creative as the young people. If you're saying, let's accept what you're saying, that it is discredited, certainly past its sell-by date or minimally successful at huge cost, why on earth continue? Who is pushing for this policy to continue? Because we have to say there's an argument on the other side and there are people at quite high levels within the government. In fact, this was mainstream thought until recently. Why the insistence mm -hmm. on continuing it? Yeah, so the mainstream thought has been I don't know, China has too many people because this uh, policy, it's, it's actually a very unpopular policy you know, implemented the uh, last 30 years. We need some of the justification and the whole government propaganda or the whole uh, media is actually in the past 30 so, years sorry, you it's talking about why China's having too many people. So you're saying it's difficult to change suddenly about face and, 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 and I don't know, maybe So the face? public opinion is still I, I would say that in the academic area and the, the and, and all the elites, only maybe 30, 40 percent people start to get the message that China is right. having this problem. A but inertia. most of the public, including many government officials, mm -hmm. has not changed or has not understand this issue right. correctly yet. But some of these people are, are demographers uh, in the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. Um, that's on the academic side. What about on the on the the interest side. This is a, a, an organization that employs half a million people um, that, that also mm. brings in through those fines or, or maintenance fees quite substantial uh, income for local mm. governments which they can use 3.3 million or 3.3 billion dollars mm. in 2012. W would that also be a factor um, economic? Yeah that, that's also a factor. In the past the government relied on advice mm -hmm. from this organization whether not or not, like yeah, you. no, whether or not China is having too many babies, right. so that's actually clearly a conflict of interest. So the China should really study this issue from a different organization, from the academics or from the reform committee, rather than and, those involved yeah, in implementing the policy. Those, yeah, right. Um, you are quite forthright about this. Have you ever had any, any worries, in, in not, perhaps not now, but in the past, in opposing what is a government policy? Dr. Yifu Shen of University of Wisconsin, uh, who has written extensively about this and written a book as well on the, on the one term, but very strong opponent of it, uh, speaks in 2010 of being expelled from Nanjing because he, orga he mm. angered a senior proponent of the policy. Mm. You have no concerns uh, uh, about your stance? Well, uh, this is a sensitive subject to even two years ago. So this book actually is the first to directly criticize uh, the one child policy. But even two years ago, this book has to be revised in many ways uh, because to avoid some of the sensitive issues. But uh, in the last two years, I think the public opinion has changed quite a bit. And this, right now, this is uh, not a sensitive subject anymore. And you also see the government is moving to the right so, direction. So it's, it's open for discussion, yeah. no, no fear of harassment? Uh, uh, it, at least not uh, if you don't do it from a very vocal human rights right. point of view. Staying always within the law and... and, and within yeah. The law. Uh, doc, Dr. E, exact, uh, in fact, Dr. E. Fu Sen, that, that uh, doctor from the University of Wisconsin, published a book also, but it was banned here initially. I think it has been published. <laughs> Uh, which also mm. addresses the policy in, in quite strong mm. terms. And he now, I, I believe, like you, speaks quite openly here in China. Yeah, that, that's exactly it. Dr. Yifu Shen wrote a very good book, but he's only been allowed to publish in Hong Kong. Uh, so, in it, But in the last two years after this book, a lot of books are on this subject right, so, been so published. So a sea change in the attitude in, in, on the official in, attitude. On the mainland. And the media is very, can be openly mm -hmm. discussed to this subject. Um, as I said, you're, you're quite forthright about this, and not, not just at a, at a personal level, um, uh, but using your sort of position in business, your company, Ctrip, um, has recently begun a, a, a campaign, as many companies do. Uh, I think we just have a look at it here. Um, th this campaign, uh, your slogan is, as a travel agent, if you want to go, just do it. Mm -hmm. And you use this sign, those, those characters on the left there actually say, if you want to give birth, just do it. And then you offer certain incentives to people who, who become pregnant over the, 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 the next mm -hmm. month or so, uh, and, and, and they get extra sort of benefits. Using, using the company like this uh, mm -hmm. to, to sort of to push a social policy, do you think that's a sort of a trend, something that might continue in China? Because generally we see social mm -hmm. policy driven from the government side. It, this is corporate not just corporate responsibility, but corporate having a particular ideology. 
Well, <laughs> well, it's not an ideology. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a simple you know, the, uh, fact that the people uh, you should have, uh, you know, if they want more baby, they should go ahead and have it. It's good, better to have two babies and for a family. Uh, that, that's just a that's simple. I, the problem is, even China realized this one-child policy, uh, that in the city, in the areas, a lot of people would actually want to have the second baby because the pressure of your work, because the high cost of raising a kid in China. Even with this reform, China still needs to, the government still need to put out more uh, actual policies to encourage people to have more Incentives. babies. Incentives. Uh, you know, our company tried to do some of that. Right. Well, also, maybe it's good for our business. So in March, uh, you know, uh, yeah, springtime. Yeah, at, at, at the forefront of yeah, this. Sure. Right, well, um, that, that's, uh, as we say, two, child, two, two children and some people won't have them. But uh, interestingly, you use the figure three here. It's the 3rd of mm. March. Uh, many of the discounts involve three people. Are you being a bit cheeky there and suggesting perhaps that, you know, when things change that actually three would be a better number than two? Is that under this? Uh, yeah, that's a lot of one way to on look at there. it. The other is three. Uh, it sounds the same as Shen, uh, which is meaning having a baby. All right. Uh, yeah. That and come and double English. three, you should have a double, right. a double baby. Um, and uh, you know, if you go on a trip uh, and uh, you know, away from work, it's actually it's good. To, it's probably a very good opportunity to have a baby, mm -hmm. and it will reward people for doing right. that. And that probably will help. People. Well, it, interesting to see, uh, uh, as I said, a corporate entity uh, pushing something like this, which, which has been up until now the, the, the purview of the government almost initially. I wonder, do, do you see this as possibly as a trend that might con continue? Do, would, you, would you like to see other companies yeah, pushing I, I, in this way, I perhaps think, environmentally or whatever? Yeah, I, th I think more and more companies will do a more um, social responsibility, corporate responsibility kind of activity uh, related to that business. Mm -hmm. uh, Chinese entrepreneurs uh, they have come a long way and they made their money and in the past because of the Chinese unique situation they've been pretty passive uh, not to involve any kind of social right are you activity. it is common for but people I think here in, in the future uh, the social change they will have right more the, the attitude like of this. business is business and social or other issues are separate is is is, is, sl is slowly changing um, uh, just before we finish here, I'd just like to, to, to go through a couple of points here. One is, again, it involves this change in attitude towards the policy itself. Uh, Wang Feng, a demographer who's with the Brookings Tsinghua Centre for Public Policy, uh, you'll be aware of, uh, with a number of other people wrote a paper on the policy. It really ends with rather a damning indictment, not just of the policy at present, but in the past. It calls it uh, a deadly error and he compares it to, to famines in the, in the late 50s and 60s and the Cultural Revolution, but says the policy was worse. He says... Um, will surpass these in impact because it's creating a society with a seriously undermined family and kin structure and a whole generation of future elderly and their children whose well-being will be seriously jeopardized. Would you agree with their conclusions? Well, it, it, it depends on uh, if it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's actually a not a very drastic policy if you're looking at 30 years ago because a lot of countries actually have sort of a similar way of, mm -hmm. sort of uh, India, discourage Bangladesh. people to mm -hmm. have less baby, fewer babies. But uh, right now, if you look at now, actually, given such a low fertility rate, it's actually a pretty absurd policy looking at today. Uh, and, dangerous and if you continue that for many years, the impact actually will be huge right. because the number of people you're talking about reducing is actually in the hundreds of millions. I mean, we know we all know that some of the past policies may only affect, you know, a very a, short, a short period, period of time and, and can maybe be, tens of millions right. of people. But this um, I think it, it can't be argued by anybody for or against that immense mm -hmm. suffering and sacrifice mm -hmm. for, for families over this mm -hmm. period. Chinese women particularly. A, a, a former family planning official called Zhang Erli in a, in a rather long TV interview recently said, he finished up, or he said in this interview, he was involved in implementing this policy. I feel guilty. Chinese women have made huge sacrifices. A responsible government should repay them. Will it ever happen? Do you think it's something that matters? That there should well, the be best way to repay them is to allow the people, of allow these women who probably in their 30s or 40s, uh, they still have a chance to have a second baby <laughs> if, mm -hmm. they, if they have, that's their preference. Um, for a better, for a larger family. 
So that's the way best to, to, to repay them. Or at least probably, allow perhaps yeah, their daughters to, yeah, to have a little children. To relax the policy completely, yeah. James Liang, thank you very much for joining us here on Level. My pleasure. Thank you.